If you want to pass the GED science exam, you need to know what to study. When you have an understanding of what will be on the test, you can study more effectively. This is the eighth video in a series where I'm going over everything you need to know to pass the GED science test. So far, we've talked about life sciences and chemistry that you'll see on the test. Today, we're going to jump into physics with an introduction to energy and work. When you have a better idea of what you'll need to know, you can focus your efforts on the best resources for you. Like always, this won't be an exhaustive overview of this topic, but I do hope it'll be a great starting point for you as you begin to study. Physics is the branch of science that is mostly concerned with matter and energy. There's a lot of crossover here between the topics that we learned in the chemistry series, just like chemistry had a lot of crossover with life sciences. When I'm thinking about physics, I'm thinking about movement, energy, sound, and light. Today, we're gonna to start with energy. But before we talk about energy, we have to have a definition for the concept of work. In physics, work is when a force is applied to an object to displace it or to set it in motion. A force could be a push or a pull, which could cause the object to move, change direction, or change speed. The definition of energy is the capacity to do work. And the two main states of energy are potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy has to do with the position of an object, whereas kinetic energy has to do with its motion. Consider lifting your foot to kick a soccer ball. When you're holding your foot back before you kick it, your foot has potential energy. It is in the position to move. When it's swinging, it has kinetic energy. It is moving. When your foot hits the ball, it transfers that energy to the ball, which in turn moves. This transfer of energy from the foot to the ball is the work. Joules is the unit of measurement that we use to describe work, and power is how we describe how fast work is done. One unit of power that you might be familiar with is horsepower. Horsepower is typically used to describe engines like those in cars. One horsepower describes the amount of energy that's needed to move 33,000 pounds one foot in one minute. You can imagine this as the strength of a horse pulling something that's very heavy, which is where horsepower got its name before we had cars. When we describe a car engine using horsepower, we're talking about the top speed that the engine can produce and its ability to maintain that speed. Cars with more horsepower can go faster. For example, most Camaros have between 300 and 400 horsepower, whereas a Prius doesn't even have 200. Another familiar unit of power is watts. When you buy a light bulb, it will describe on the box the amount of watts that's needed to power it. The measurement of watts describes how many joules are used every second. Traditional incandescent light bulbs typically use between 25 and 100 watts. And when you're shopping for light bulbs, you can choose a brighter light bulb by choosing one that requires more watts. However, LED light bulbs require far less watts to achieve the same brightness, typically between two and 18 watts. This is why changing your light bulbs from incandescents to LEDs can be a way to reduce your energy usage. But wait a second, we were talking about energy in terms of motion and movement. So why are we talking about light bulbs? It turns out that energy exists in many different forms. The six basic forms of energy are chemical, electrical, radiant, mechanical, and nuclear. Chemical energy is stored between the bonds of molecules. Anything that you would think of as fuel, like wood, coal, gas, or oil, all contain chemical energy that can be released in order to perform work. Even sugar contains chemical energy, and our bodies reorganize the molecules when we digest it in order to give us the energy that we need to grow and to move. Electrical energy has to do with the movement of electrons. We discussed in the chemistry series that all matter is made of atoms. And atoms are composed of subatomic particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Electrons are constantly orbiting or moving around the nucleus of the atom. We also talked about how some elements have electrons that are only loosely attracted to their nuclei and therefore can be moved easily between atoms. That movement of electrons between different atoms creates what we call a current of electricity. Radiant energy has to do with the movement of light, but also with other things like x-rays, gamma rays, and radio waves that we can't see with our eyes. 
Check out this diagram which shows the electromagnetic spectrum, and you can see that visible light is only a very small portion of that spectrum. You might be asked to inspect and answer questions about diagrams like this on the GED test. Mechanical energy is the energy of motion like we were discussing before. Mechanical energy has to do with motion and the potential for motion. For mechanical energy, you can think about wheels turning, springs springing, doors opening. Even sound is a form of mechanical energy because sound waves are vibrations that travel through the air, through water, through other substances. Think about how if you put your hand on a speaker, you can feel the vibrations in your hand. Nuclear energy is released when the nuclei of atoms are either split apart or fused together. We call this splitting apart of nuclei fission. This is the type of energy that's generated in nuclear power plants or used to power nuclear subs. Fusion, or the combining together of nuclei, is what happens in stars like our sun. Finally, thermal energy has to do with the motion of molecules, and it is directly related to the temperature of any substance. We talked about this in the chemistry videos as well. When the molecules of any substance are moving faster, that substance will be warmer. The speed of the movement of the molecules of a substance can even determine the state of matter of that substance, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Warmer objects will transfer their thermal energy to adjacent objects in order to become the same temperature. This process is called conduction. Think about a hot cup of coffee releasing its heat into the surrounding room or into your hands as you hold it until it cools down to room temperature or the same temperature of the room that surrounds it. Energy can change between its different forms. Consider a flashlight. The flashlight has a battery which stores energy in the form of chemical energy. When the flashlight is turned on, that energy travels in the form of electricity through the wires in the flashlight. Then that electrical energy is transformed into light energy in the light bulb, and sometimes into heat too, depending on the type of bulb. There are a lot of other examples of energy changing from one form to another to another. Think about mechanical energy of the wind turning a windmill, which is then converted into electrical energy, which can be used to power lights and appliances in people's homes. Most coal power plants convert the chemical energy that's in the coal into thermal energy by burning it, then use that thermal energy to boil water to create steam. The steam moves a turbine, which creates mechanical energy, and then the mechanical energy can be converted into electrical energy. But we actually didn't go far back enough on that one because coal is just fossilized organic material or really old plants. And plants use photosynthesis to convert light energy from the sun into chemical energy which they can use to grow. And as I mentioned before, the light energy from our sun comes from the nuclear fusion that is happening in the star. So energy is constantly changing from form to form, but it's never used up or destroyed in that process. In fact, the law of the conservation of energy states that energy is never created or destroyed. It's only transformed from different forms. This sounds a lot like the other law of conservation that we learned about in chemistry. That was the law of conservation of mass, which states that mass is never created or destroyed, only rearranged in chemical reactions. And in fact, there is a relationship between energy and mass. You might have seen this formula before, E equals mc squared. The E stands for energy, which is equal to mass times the speed of light squared, or times itself. Since light travels extremely fast, about three times 10 to the eighth power or 300 million meters per second, that means that a very small amount of mass contains the potential for a very large amount of energy. This relationship was described by Albert Einstein, and it was a foundational idea for the generation of nuclear power. Okay, so that was a very brief overview of work and the different forms of energy that you should be familiar with to do well on the GED science test. Of course, there's a lot more to be learned about this, so the physics folks can let us know in the comments what else they think we should know. And if you have any questions, please also comment so that we can help each other out. I definitely recommend that you take some time with the GED preparation manual to read a little bit more about these topics and to try some practice questions like the ones that you'll see on the test. I always recommend the Kaplan version, which I will link below. You could also use 
any GED preparation manual that your library has available to borrow. And there are a lot of great physics videos on Crash Course and Khan Academy that I will link below. Again, no need to become an expert, but your goal is to become familiar and comfortable with the vocabulary and concepts that you will see so that you can read and answer questions with confidence. On this channel, I make videos about how to study more effectively so that you can achieve your goals. And in the coming weeks, I'll be talking about the remaining content that'll appear on the GED science test, including more physics and earth and space science. So please subscribe if you'd like to learn more. Again, I have a whole GED science playlist that includes all the life sciences and chemistry topics, as well as playlists for the other three tests. If you're just starting to study, you can check out my video about how to get started. Or if you're ready to test, you can see my video about how to see if you're eligible to take the test online. If this video is helpful to you, please press the like button so that YouTube knows that this is a great resource for you. It is your support that enables me to take the time to make these resources for you. So thank you as always for watching and until next time, happy studying.